welcome to Best of Live at Five, where we'll be showcasing some of the best bits from the last few months of the nightly variety show that is Live at Five. Coming up tonight, we meet the Owls at the Loch Lomond Bird of Prey Centre. I shoot some hoops with the Scottish under-18s basketball squad and we're on the ice with the oldest hockey team in the country. All that and more still to come, but first we're looking back on our series of features on the Roman invasion of Scotland. Here's historian Fergus Sutherland with the story of the first Roman battalion to cross the border and head north into Caledonian territory. About 2,000 years ago, the Roman army swept out of Italy and began conquering Europe and North Africa. They reached Britain in AD 43 and crushed that as well. They thundered all the way up to Scotland and there they met their match. There they advanced ground to a halt. They built Hadrian's Wall, and that was the end of the Roman Empire. Scotland won, Romans nil. But is that what really happened? The Roman Empire was the greatest in the ancient world. It controlled all the lands of the Mediterranean, including North Africa. It also had great chunks of Western Europe and Great Britain. In AD 43, the Roman army, under the instructions of the Emperor Claudius, launched its invasion of mainland Britain, the start of centuries of permanent occupation. 70 years later, the Emperor Hadrian came to Britain to inspect his northern frontier. There, he ordered the building of the wall that bears his name to this day, Hadrian's Wall. And it's commonly believed that that is where the invasion stopped, never reaching Scotland, or as it was known to the Romans, Caledonia. But that's not quite true. Years before the building of Hadrian's Wall, a man named Gnaeus Julius Agricola became governor of Britannia, the province of Great Britain. In AD 79, he was the first man to take a Roman army north into the mysterious, unknown land of the Caledonians. For a few years, Agricola's army rampaged through what is now southern Scotland, first into the borders, then into Ayrshire, then across to Lothian. Then they began moving up the east coast, building marching camps as they went. One of the greatest of those camps was built at Ardoch, near Breco in Perthshire. Ardoch Roman Fort is probably the best preserved earthen Roman fort that you'll find anywhere in the empire. It's rectangular as they all were. It's about two hectares in size. And in fact, there's evidence here for about six or seven different forts and marching camps. As you can see from the earthworks around us, this is major engineering. And these guys used to build things like this at the end of every single march. They were absolutely massive. This is a permanent fort. But believe me, it's not much different to what they would have found throughout the empire whenever the Roman army went a-marching. Every camp was designed the same way, and that was largely so that if they were attacked during the night, all the soldiers knew where to go to. And uh, this did actually happen uh, in AD 82. One of Agricola's camps were attacked and the Ninth Spanish Legion was disturbed in the night by a huge horde of Caledonians pouring in. They could have been massacred and it's happened before in other parts of the empire. But Agricola saved the day by bringing the cavalry in and driving the Caledonians off. Otherwise, that would have been the end of the campaign. Well, staying with Scottish history now, the Picts lived in the north and east of the country throughout the first millennium AD, and carvings made by some of them survive to this day in the stone of Kirkcaldy's Weems Caves. Here's Sue Hampstead from the Save Weems Ancient Cave Society to tell us more. We're at the Weems Caves, and these are caves that are famous for 
uh, the carvings they've got, and particularly Pictish carvings. Picts use this symbolic language so that there's recognisable symbols. We can look at in the case that's very typically Pictish. So we're looking at perhaps 500 AD. Uh, we have this long necked bird here, possibly a goose. Uh, there's a double disc to that side, and another one down here with a floriated rod running horizontally. Uh, crescent moons over here, and we think over here that's possibly a Pictish brooch there. Uh, leaping salmon there, so the Picts carved uh, lots of birds and beasts. They're comparatively primitive compared to uh, the very fine Pictish carvings you get on standing stones. What we have here is a series of cut marks which pro possibly date back to the Bronze Age, and if so, then they're a good two and a half thousand years old. So if that's the case, they're possibly the oldest carving anywhere in the caves. Over here we have a carving that some have thought to be Viking. Uh, they've even identified the figure here as the, the Norse god Thor holding his hammer Mjolnir. I personally think that's a bit over fanciful. The rock's being carved out. Uh, behind to make somewhere where you could pass a rope through. It's called a cleat and we think the purpose of these was probably to uh, tether animals that were brought into the, the cave. They haven't always been treated with the respect that we would like them to be now. So you can see that there's one coloured in blue here. That was blue chalk that somebody used but it can be as harmful to the carving to take that off as to leave it there. So we're kind of stuck with that and you can see that there's white chalk being used here. We've only been able to look at a couple of the caves today, but there's a whole series of caves that make up the Weems Caves along this bit of coastline. There's a lot of clues, evidence as to how they were used over that time. Jumping forward in time to about 500 years after those Pictish carvings were made and from the east to the west coast now to Govan, which in 1000 AD was one of the most important settlements in the country. Here's Fergus again with a look back at the time when the borough was the centre of power for the Kingdom of Strathclyde. Mention Govan today and you think industry. It was one of the great industrial centres of the world, especially for shipbuilding. In fact, it was an independent borough as well for a long, long time until Glasgow swallowed up in 1912. It was, in fact, the fifth biggest borough in Scotland in its own right. But travel back a thousand years and you'd find yourself in a very different place, a much more important place. It used to be thought that when the Roman Empire collapses, it leaves all these power vacuums. Gradually over time, tribes come together and eventually those coalesce into kingdoms. All these kingdoms, after many hundreds of years of forming allegiances and then falling out and going to war and playing off each other, eventually all kind of coalesced into one single kingdom, Scotland. This was a time before modern Scotland had developed. On the west coast, you had the Gaelic-speaking Dalriada. On the east coast, we had the, the Pictish Kingdom. Well, we're not exactly sure what language they spoke there, but right in the middle, right where we're standing here, was the Kingdom of Strathclyde. Yes, Govan, I don't mean Glasgow, I mean Govan, right here, capital of the Kingdom of Strathclyde. The Kingdom of Strathclyde was just that. It was the kingdom in the Strath or the valley of the River Clyde. It stretched as far north as the top of Loch Lomond, down the Ayrshire coast, and at one point even as far down as the English borders. We've got a couple of images here oh, they're from, wonderful. from Govan. Um, oh, both taken from the same spot by the look of it yeah, as well. Yeah, almost. This photograph here is from the 1930s, so if we skip back in time a thousand yes, years. This, this is absolutely astonishing. Yeah, so this is Govan around a thousand AD. Oh, God. We're looking from above towards Partick on this side of the river. Yeah, this is Clyde yes. and then the River Kelvin coming down Wind to meet it. Down, yeah. So this is the Doomster Hill. The famous Doomster the Hill. The famous Doomster Hill. God, it was big, wasn't it? Yeah, well, about, um, there's descriptions of it in the new statistical accounts from the 1840s, and the mm -hmm. minister at Govan uh, gave dimensions for it. It was about uh, five metres high, just over five metres high, and about 45 metres in diameter. So this is a big, big structure. Yes. 
the Clyde's pretty shallow at this point. The yeah. Kelvin comes down and, and dumps a load of silt when it right. hits the Clyde and it all banks up here so right. you could just scuttle over. It's a, it's a very strategic point, really. And there's there's a there's a connection here. Yeah, so that's where they, you walked from the church to Doomster and back again? Yeah. Wow. And the current churchyard wall pretty much sits exactly on the bank. Still on the same thing? Yeah, so you... Isn't that, that incredible? It is. It's, a, it's an amazing wow. kind of continuity, really. This is a kind of complete power centre. That's fantastic, isn't so it? So yeah. you have your um, your royal palace, palace yes. and your church yes. and your ceremonial site. And, and meanwhile, up in Glasgow? Hee-haw. Hee-haw, yes, <laughs> ah, yes. So poor old Glasgow. Yeah. It is. So Govan is not much older. older. It's an incredibly rich, mm -hmm. dense place in yeah. terms of its kind of history and yeah. heritage. We've got more Live at Five Best Bits still to come with owls, wildcats and some highly trained dogs. Join us again after the break.